Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode in the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I'm Carrie Ottavern from the Leuven Center of Global Governance Studies, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today, we are joined by Professor Rosemary Salomon to discuss her book, The Rise of English, Global Politics and the Power of Language, published in 2021 by Oxford University Press. Professor Rosemary Salomon is the Kenneth Wang Professor of Law at St. John's University School of Law in Queens, New York. Trained as a linguist and a lawyer, she is an internationally recognized expert and commentator on language rights, education law and policy, and comparative equality. An elected member of the American Law Institute and a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, she's a former faculty member of the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University, lecturer in Harvard Institute for Educational Management, and trustee of the State University of New York. Also joining us today as discussant is Professor Helder Descouter, Helder is Professor of Social and Political Philosophy at KU Leuven. He works on issues of linguistic justice, federalism in multinational states, nationalism and nation building, migration and citizenship, and the case for non-territorial jurisdictional authority. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Rosemary of about 25 minutes. Then Helder will start off the discussion by offering some reflections, asking a few questions, and Rosemary will have an opportunity to respond first. Then we will turn to questions from you, the audience. So please feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the webinar chat function at the bottom of the webinar window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentations. So just click on the chat, send your question to me um, by uh, typing it out. Before we begin, just a few quick words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance, with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. A three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank Rosemary and Helder for joining us today. And now it is my great pleasure to hand the floor over to Rosemary. You have the floor. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you for inviting me to discuss the book. What initially, uh, what initially led me to the rise of English were legal disputes in Italy and France back in 2013 over the use of English in teaching university courses and programs. Unpacking those disputes made clear to me the force of English as the dominant lingua franca and its link to globalization, internationalization, and neoliberalism. I also saw the direct impact on educational equity, identity, and democratic participation. That very tentative beginning ultimately took me on a seven year journey through seven countries, seven languages, and a vast store of scholarship that ended up in a manuscript of over 700 pages. Along the way, I encountered the work of activists, political philosophers, jurists, economists, linguists, and literary icons, both within and beyond the Western canon. Putting that all together, my aim ultimately was to capture what I had learned into a book accessible to a wide and international audience on English and its kaleidoscopic effects, both past and present, but also with an eye to the near future. Guiding me through this journey were two interrelated precepts that politics in a given geographic and historical setting shape and reshape language policies and languages over time. And secondly, that government policies that maintain an unequal relationship among languages carry very serious economic, political, and social consequences, not just for the speakers of those languages, but also for the countries where they reside, whether they're living there by chance or by choice. As I mulled over the concept of a lingua franca, I instinctively turned to the works of Dante Alighieri the medieval poet, moral philosopher, and father of modern Italian for an appropriate quote or an insight on the power of the vernacular in the face of a dominant lingua franca. A visit to Ravenna, Italy, and you see here, this is uh, Ravenna, Italy, to engage with 100 cittadini, local citizens, 
reciting verses from La Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy, before Dante's tomb, that's Dante's tomb, followed by a procession through the streets to the, uh, the drum beat, this haunting drum beat, uh, and a live performance uh, at the uh, Rasso Theater, which would, and it was audience participation in the performance of the Inferno, made palpable to me the enduring force of a language in defining a community. Well, first looking at the dominance of English. English, as you know, is everywhere. It's an official language of the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the International Criminal Court, <clears throat> and NATO. Across the globe, there are more, <clears throat> excuse me, there are more non-native speakers of English than native speakers. For young people, English governs the books they read, the films and television programs they watch, the cultural values they absorb, and their career options. English accounts for 60% of internet content. Without a doubt, English both fuels the global economy and rides on it. But we all know that the spread of English was not an accident. It started with the British Empire, which at its height covered a quarter of the globe. A core strategy of colonialism was to control language. Devaluing local languages and knowledge preserved the colonial myth that these languages could not function beyond everyday life. In the mid 20th century, just as the British Empire was unraveling and Europe was recovering from a devastating war, the United States was able to grow the importance of English through political, economic, and cultural influence. For many years, multinational corporations and international development organizations helped spread, spread the English in newly independent countries. The, Mon the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the British Council, the British Department for International Development, the US Agency for International Development, they all pushed a pro-English agenda. They did this in a variety of ways through scholarships, training, textbooks, curricular experts, program designers, and research reports. But relying solely on English while excluding indigenous languages has been a serious blind spot in many of the countries receiving that aid. In any case, while a common language undeniably has economic, diplomatic, and intercultural benefits, English also has divided the world into haves and have nots and created political and cultural strains across the globe. But rather than summarily conclude that English is bad, good, or neutral, whether it's a global communication panacea or a killer language, I set out in my book to explore the nuanced effects of English and its global dominance. I decided to look through the lens of education, long considered the ultimate social leveler, and where it's conventionally believed that speaking and writing the same language help create social and political stability. It's also where English has raised concerns over national identity, equal opportunity, and quality. My initial plan was to write a book on the value of English, uh, of language in the global economy, examining winners and lunar losers on both sides of the Atlantic. But the deeper I dug into the research and the more world events continued to evolve, the connections to the post-colonial world began to take shape. So did the forces again of globalization, internationalization, and neoliberalism. It especially became clear to me that language and languages have become strategic economic assets in themselves. And so the book evolved into three interrelated parts, one on Europe, one on the post-colonial world, and finally the Anglophone world. In, the Europe, in Europe, the debate over English largely runs around or, along two streams. The first has to do with the growing use of English in EU institutions despite the EU recognizing 24 languages among its member states. This has been especially troubling to France whose language was in the past considered the language of diplomacy, literature, and high culture. With France now heading the European Council presidency, President Emmanuel Macron has stated that he would make French its official language. The long-term success of that project remains doubtful. For some EU officials, especially those from Eastern Europe who spent much time and energy learning English, moving to French doesn't appear to be a comfortable option. That doesn't resolve the problem 
of English increasingly becoming the favored language of both formal and informal communication within EU institutions. In the wake of Brexit, whether a distinct form of Euro-English develops remains to be seen. In any case, the number of native English speakers in the EU is now quite small, essentially limited to Ireland and Malta, which has amplified the debate over English. Ultimately, the question goes to the heart of the EU's political identity, which has been difficult to define. It's a question that EU leaders have little institutional bandwidth to tackle at this time, given far more pressing problems, including Russia's persistent power grabs, now especially in Ukraine, the economic fallout from the pandemic, mounting nationalism, and China's growing economic footprint. Yet it cannot be overlooked that across Europe, close to 100% of students study English at some point in their education, many of them as their primary foreign language. So it seems unlikely that English will be abandoned as a primary working language in EU institutions in favor of any other language, whether it be French or German, anytime soon. The second point of concern in Europe centers on the rising number of English taught courses and programs, what we call English medium instruction in European universities. Universities use English for a number of reasons, to drive internationalization and burnish their global reputations, to prepare their own students for the global economy, and in some cases to raise revenue. Here the debate revolves around quality and access, the burdens on students and faculty who don't speak English fluently, and the preservation of national language and identity. Occasionally there's a, a reference, and very occasionally, to less privileged students, many of them immigrants or the children of immigrants. English taught programs tend to favor students who have benefited from high quality English instruction in well-resourced schools and from private tutoring. Others have difficulty mining the depths of English, particularly in reading assignments and writing assignments, and their writing very often lacks substance and nuance. The move toward English has fallen equally on professors. Faculty hiring and promotions, especially in the hard sciences, are increasingly based on citations in indexed English language journals. Academic conferences are increasingly conducted only or primarily in English, which freezes out professors who lack strong English skills from important networking opportunities. Where higher education is state funded, as is common in Europe, publishing solely in English denies many taxpayers access to important information affecting their daily lives. Even the Nordic countries and the Netherlands, and, and these are countries that spearheaded EMI or English taught programs, they now question whether they may have gone too far and at what cost to educational quality and to the national language. Heated debates in France and Italy, where I began my study, have raised many of these concerns. In 2003, intellectuals and others in France sparred over legal changes that permitted more flexibility for universities to teach in languages other than French, which ultimately would be English. Yet by 2021, France had jumped to fourth place in Europe, excluding the UK, in the number of English language programs. In 2017, the Italian Constitutional Court struck down a plan to switch all graduate programs to English over a two-year period, at the prestigious Milan's Polytechnic Institute. There the court upheld the right of students to learn and the right of professors to teach in their national language. Yet, uh, if you look at the website of the Polytechnic Institute, you will see that graduate course, most of the graduate courses by far are still offered in English. Again, France above all has tried mightily to preserve its national language and its inter international status. Emmanuel Macron has put great effort into resetting the colonial narrative in former colonies, especially in Africa, where English is weakening France's grip. Macron has suggested that French become the number one language in Africa. African leaders have been pragmatically more receptive to that discourse. Africa's intellectual elite, however, has dismissed those efforts as a sign of neocolonialism. France's prime competitor, uh, in Africa is China. Like France, China has set about using the soft power of language to strengthen diplomatic and commercial ties in Africa. 
China is essentially cashing in on Africa's demographic dividend. About 60% of Africa's 1.3 million people are now under the age of 25, with a median age of 19.7. China is using what has been called smart power, investing in education and language learning. For young Africans, Chinese language skills translate into jobs. For Chinese investors, they reduce the cost of doing business in African countries. Between 2003 and 2018, the number of African students studying in China grew from 1,800 to over 81,000. There are now over 60 Confucius Institutes in Africa. These are joint programs with African universities. To what extent Chinese will replace French or English on the African continent remains to be seen. That brings us to the post-colonial world. There more generally, the debate over English primarily revolves around the language of instruction in elementary and secondary schools and the importance of teaching children in a language that they understand, which seems intuitive, despite the market value of English and despite the loss in regional and indigenous languages. At the same time, it has put a spotlight on disparities in the quality of English taught to the rich and to the poor. Here we find overlapping justifications for officially adopting English from economic mobility in India and Morocco to the added push toward redress and transformation in South Africa and to some extent in Rwanda. Each of these countries presents a distinct linguistic landscape and history. First, looking at Rwanda, uh, Rwanda being formerly a French-speaking uh, country, but formerly uh, as well a Belgian colony. Uh, here we see the problem has been resolving the 1990s genocide. Uh, and that in itself has moved the country to shift officially to English in 2008. How that came to be is a complicated story of conflict between the Tutsi who became English-speaking while in exile in Uganda and the French-speaking Hutus and the role that France played in the conflict. Until 2003, French and King Rwanda, which is also the national language, remained the country's two official languages. At that time, the constitution formally adopted English as a third. Unlike many post-colonial countries, Rwanda is practically monolingual. Upwards of 99% of the population speaks King Rwanda. In 2008, the government switched all instruction to English without any preparation for language, for uh, material development or for teacher training. The results on student learning were devastating. In 2011, under pressure from international organizations like UNICEF, the government reverted to teaching in Kenya Rwanda in grades one through three. In Morocco, it's been a question of navigating the country's Arab roots along with preserving Tamazit the language commonly spoken by most Moroccans, while recognizing the value of English in the global economy. For both, both Arabic and Tamazit are the country's official languages. For many Moroccans, French is an undesirable remnant of French colonialism. In 2019, the education minister announced that French would remain the second language after Arabic in Moroccan public schools, at least for the next 10 years, to develop a core of teachers competent in English. Many Moroccans took to social media, arguing that English, the language of globalization should be the primary foreign language. They would prefer English to French. In South Africa, English has become caught up in the struggle to address the legacy of apartheid. The official languages include English and Afrikaans, along with nine African languages. The black population sees Afrikaans as the language of oppression and English as the language of resistance and liberation. Yet white Afrikaners and the colored or mixed race population still push to preserve Afrikaans, especially in schools and universities. The South African constitution grants the right to receive education in the official language of, or languages of one's choice in public educational, in, no, I, let me go back there, in public educational institutions uh, where reasonably practical, uh, considering all reasonable alternatives and taking into account equity, practicability, and the need to redress the results of past discriminatory laws and policies. We see the constitutional court repeatedly being called on to resolve these conflicts in moving the country forward 
from, toward transformation and redress. In some cases, school officials have refused to admit black English speaking students ostensibly based on language or, or lack of space. In other cases, they've refused to offer dual or parallel instruction in Africans and Afrikaans in English. In a series of very high profile cases, the court has upheld university policies, switching entirely or primarily to English instruction with varying accommodations to Afrikaans. It seems that the court has tried to go beyond the past by supporting English while promoting multilingualism and especially African languages. At the same time, most recently, uh, in, in a case challenging a plan to phase out Afrikaans at the University of South Africa, and that's a, a distance learning program. The court suggested decoupling Af Afrikaans from the memory of apartheid and even placing it among Africa's official indigenous languages. Yet to what extent Afrikaans fits within this uh, or under this multilingual umbrella remains highly contested. When we look at India, uh, India and English competes on a very wide linguistic terrain that covers seven, that covers uh, uh, 29 states and seven union territories, and they're defined largely by language. English, India is almost unique in the large number of people who speak more than one language. That said, English has really enjoyed a favored place in government and schooling since colonial times. The 1949 constitution adopted Hindi as the official language, though not the national language. The idea was that Hindi would replace English in government in 15 years. Well, that never did occur. The Official Languages Act of 1963 maintained English as a subsidiary official language. Parents go to extreme lengths to educate their children in English, but the quality of the programs differs widely between elite schools and the low fee private schools that exploit the poor. Speakers of regional language, especially in the South, see English as a bulwark against Hindi. In recent years, English has become caught in a high stakes tug of war between the current nationalist government promoting Hindi and the consequent pushback from speakers of other Indian languages. The government's language policy adopted two years ago, and this is really very revealing. It notably is silent on the role of English in the overall curriculum. So for the government, the pro-Hindi agenda seems to be winning out. That takes us to the third political context. Anglophones and the monolingual mindset. The fact that English appears so pervasive has lulled Anglophones into believing that there's no need to learn another language. The number of students studying languages, in fact, is sharply declining. As I sorted through the numbers in the United States, I found glaring and very troubling inequities. Disadvantaged students are typically fed a steady diet of reading and math and denied foreign language learning. Racial and ethnic data on what we call advanced placement exams in, in secondary school in world languages show lower numbers and lower scores among racial and, eth and ethnic minorities. Not surprisingly, similar racial and ethnic disparities also come up in study abroad programs. And yet we know very clearly that language skills are highly valued on the global market. Only a quarter of the world is even minimally competent in English. That means that monolingual speakers cannot tap into a large body of knowledge or take advantage of many career and business opportunities. Even worse, they risk the world talking over their heads while they become politically and culturally isolated. Though English is used by almost 26% of people on the internet, Chinese is not far behind at 19%. A substantial amount of internet communication also takes place in Spanish and Arabic. As those of you who are bilingual or multilingual know, reading or listening to world events in different language media gives you a much bigger picture than limiting yourself to English speaking outlets. It also gives you a sense of how others are processing your politics. All that said, there is a growing movement in the United States to defy what has been called the monolingual mindset and promote multilingualism. Advocates are reframing the narrative on language learning. They rely very heavily on the work of Ellen Bialystok, a Canadian psychologist who has examined the co cognitive benefits of bilingualism. According to Bialystok and her colleagues, bilinguals show increased attention control, working memory, 
and emotional intelligence that can even delay the onset of dementia in old age. Most notably, a report published by, in 2017 by a commission on language learning, uh, and, and, and that was a commission that was initiated by the Congress itself, has become a blueprint for increasing the number of foreign language teachers and supporting heritage language programs in the US. The most impressive development is the growth in dual language immersion programs in the schools. In the book, I look at three settings where dual language immersion has taken off in California, in Utah, and in New York City. In California, the turnaround has been dramatic. Back in 1998, a voter-initiated constitutional amendment looked like it was sounding the death knell for bilingual programs for the state's very large Spanish-speaking population. What the initiative did, however, was it actually mobilized parents and lawmakers, and that led to a counter-initiative in 2016 that brought language programs back into the schools. In Utah, it, immersion has been a phenomenal success. It began in, 19, uh, in 1979 in one particular school district. It took another three decades to take off. But what happened ultimately, and, and it was a confluence of forces, including a very supportive governor, a state senator, a world language specialist working for the, uh, state, the state school system, and the support of the LDS church, which trains its young members to work abroad on two-year missions. By 2021, the program had grown from 600 students in 35 schools to 65,000 students in 285 schools. The program has been an economic boon for the state, attracting multilingual and multinational corporations that look for workers with foreign language skills. In New York City, it's been the French community that has sparked what we call a bilingual revolution in the public schools with the, the support of the French embassy. This has been, rather than a top-down, this has been a bottom-up effort by French-speaking parents who were looking for an affordable bilingual school option for their children. A key selling point for parents is the marketability of languages in the global economy. There's a significant body of research findings on the market value of both English and other languages in terms of employment and higher earnings. Upwards of 23 million jobs in the US are tied to international trade in goods and services. Languages spoken in emerging economies like in Latin America and also China have become a significant part of the corporate skill set. But the need for language skills goes well beyond multinational business. Given the large number of immigrants, not only in the United States, but across the world, there's a rising demand for language and cross-cultural skills in the service industries, in healthcare, and in criminal justice. In urban areas with large pockets of immigrants, social service agencies and housing, education, domestic violence, unemployment, immigration, demand workers who speak a variety of languages. Now it's tempting to rely on translation software in order to make this all happen. Yet anyone using that software knows that the output is less than perfect. Translators and interpreters are often used in situations that demand on the spot decisions like healthcare and national security where relying on machine translation could prove risky. The current pandemic has been a reality check on the critical need for multilingual workers in the health fields. It's also, it also become very clear that machine translation was limited in what it could do. The meaning of official advice got lost, if literally translated. The term social distancing proved ambiguous in cultures that are used to socially socializing collectively. When you think of the grave consequences that could follow, you can't make a more compelling case for human translation. So looking ahead, uh, I end with three questions. First, do we need a common global language? Using a common language has undoubtedly facilitated teamwork and knowledge sharing across countries. The global seminar today that we're all participating in is made possible by the very fact that all of us can communicate in a common language. The Pfizer vaccine against COVID-19, the first to be rolled out in Europe and North America, was the product of a partnership between the US pharmaceutical company Pfizer and the German company BioNTech. Without the use of English as a common language, it might not have developed with such unprecedented speed. Well, the second question, can English do it all? In the end, certainly English cannot do it all. If anything, the pandemic has taught us 
that the world is interconnected and that we need to increase our ability to speak to each other as part of a global community. And finally, is English the last lingua franca? It's not unreasonable to think of another lingua franca pushing English aside someday, though not in the near future. France will likely only make headway in its former French colonies. China's repressive policies are dimming the appeal of Mandarin Chinese. Perhaps it will be Spanish, which is spoken in fa on five major continents. But for now, policymakers around the world, we have to have to deal with what we have. Uh, and they have to look at both the opportunities and dangers of English uh, and to see English as a critical component of multilingualism. Uh, and so I'll stop there uh, and I, I welcome uh, Helder's uh, questions and discussions. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for this world tour uh, and also a sectoral tour. It's been uh, so much information and, and incredibly you packed so much into a short half hour. Uh, so before we turn to Helder for his um, intervention, I would like to just remind the audience that the Q&A will begin shortly. So I invite you to send me your questions via the Q&A box or the chat box, either one at the bottom of the webinar window. Uh, you can see those two buttons if you scroll down to the bottom. So send me your questions through that feature. And Helder, we now turn to you for your presentation. I don't know if you wanted to bring up that slide or... Yes, perfect. All right, so um, hello, my name is Helder de Schutter. I'm a, well, this is an online uh, webinar, so I can't say I'm here in Leuven, so but I'm a professor in Leuven, also where Katie is uh, based, uh, of philosophy in the philosophy department. Um, I've been working for uh, a number of years now on issues of nationalism, collective identity, and specifically language issues. So I very much welcome this book. I really enjoyed reading it. It was um, it was a great read. I read it for the purpose of today, and I really learned a lot. As you, as Katie just said, it's really Rosemary really takes us on a world tour, and with uh, as a skillful guide, you Rosemary show us in every corner of the world the issues that English brings up, and I think it's amazing. It's it was very rich, very interesting from. India to Rwanda to uh, the Netherlands, Italy, and various issues in the EU and in the United States, South Africa, um, it, it's uh, Algeria, Morocco. It's incredible the, the wealth of material that you've shared. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, so I have one reflection and one question. I was asked to give some reflections and questions. So one reflection, one uh, question for you. They are reflected in both sides of the slide. I'll try in, uh, out of respect for the great book to make my question a bit critical or in the sense, you know, to engender, a, in, in an attempt to engender a conversation. And the first is not a question, but it's simply a reflection. So that's the first half of the slide. My reflection is the following one. So English is clearly, um, as you show, Rosemary very clearly, is, is overpowering, is dominant all over the world. And I was, and sometimes on this world tour that you bring us with all these cases, um, one wants to sort of understand what is underlying every particular case, because with all the wealth of information, it can be daunting and you skillfully guide us through all the cases. I thought in addition to what you do, whether you think it might be helpful to, so, to think of the following frame that I would suggest, it's not a frame, I mean, not to reformulate a book, I don't want to be arrogant in that way, but I was just thinking, reading the book, I thought there seemed to be three different issues here, and I wonder whether you agree with that. So three domains, I would call them of linguistic justice, and by linguistic justice, that's typically a political philosopher's concern, justice in the sense of understanding what a morally right thing for the state to do is, so what's the morally right thing to do, the right thing to do from a moral point of view. And so I think if you look at issues of justice, they're I think in the case of English and in fact of maybe every other language, there might be three things that are relevant. So I would call them interlinguistic, intralinguistic and global linguistic justice. So interlinguistic justice concerns issues of morality or of justice um, uh, resulting from the existence of different language communities within the same political body, maybe the state, but can also be a regional body. So. Um, so there are 
uh, 24 official languages in the European Union. There are 11 in South Africa. English is one of them in both cases. So the question is in such a political entity, how do we deal with different language communities? Uh, is English going to get a special status or not superior to all others or just one of the many? This is also what is relevant, for example, in Canada, where English, apart from French and the languages of the First Nations, are in a form of competition. So interlinguists, or, or in, in the case of Belgium, English is not a national language. There are three official languages in Belgium, Dutch, French, and English, uh, and, and German, sorry, English is not one of them. So issues of interlinguistic justice look at the political entity. It's, it, is the, it has multiple uh, language communities and what, how do we rule the country or the political body and what's the role of in English where English is one of those languages. Issues of intralinguistic justice, intra, concern the just response to group-based linguistic differences within the language community. So if we had perfect linguistic equality worldwide between the 7,000 plus languages that the world has, um, the job wouldn't have been finished because once you open the hood of every particular language community, you see a wealth of inequality within a language community as well. I'm thinking then of ethnic, class, race, uh, or geography-based intra-linguistic differences. So issues um, with respect to this pop up, for example, in the 80s, there was this discussion in Britain over standard uh, English uh, versus uh, the many form, the many non-standard forms. So think of issues uh, also of the Queen's English, the kind of English used on the BBC and so on. In the US, this plays less than in the UK a role with respect to Class, so class is really the dividing intralinguistic issue in the UK. In the US, it's often more ethnic or, or, or racially connected. So issues of African American vernacular English versus standard American and so on. Um, but also in global English, this is, becomes a role. Think, for example, of Singlish in Singapore as one version of English, or the version that Indian people from India speak as being slightly different, or or interestingly different and so on. So that's one issue. And then the last issue is global linguistic justice is the, the I think <laughs> this as a unique category, the just response to the emergence of English as the global lingua franca. It seems to me, I, I, I wonder what you think of this Rosemary, it's just a reflection, a suggestion, because it occurs to me that if you look at it from this lens, you, it helps to understand that different issues often pop up in these various uh, domains. So in the interlingua, in the first domain, we often talk about issues of fairness or of neutrality. So English being a more neutral language than Hindi for India, uh, for example, or perhaps English being fairer or not and uh, other solutions in a post Brexit European Union or English being completely unfair and not neutral in Canada as the, if that were to be, if it were to be argued for as the, as the, as the one Canadian overarching language, for example. So issues of fairness or neutrality are crucial to that first domain, whereas in the second domain, it seems to be more about issues of educational equality or educational opportunities, socioeconomic equality. We want to make sure that children from lower class backgrounds, for example, really uh, get to participate on the public realm on an equal footing. And then the question is, what's the, what's, what should you do with dialect? Should you recognize dialects equally, or should you expect dialect speakers to change their vernacular into the standard form of the language? This is also big, for example, in Germany with respect to standard German, think of Bavarian German and so on. And then the third issue seems to be more, if I understand it correctly, um, or I, about issues of economic globalization, economic mobility, uh, often also neoliberalism, the global market, these kinds of things cluster more or play more of a role in the global linguistic justice scheme. I just offer this, I wonder whether it might help to understand the wealth of cases we have where English plays a role and it might play a different role depending on the domain within which we are looking at. The second question is meant to be critical to engender some discussion. So I really enjoyed the book. Sometimes there are at Times there is an undercurrent, a, a developing argument in the book, which sometimes suggests that, in fact, without always realizing it, native speakers are beginning to lose out uh, in a world where English is on the rise. And uh, this comes in the book at several places around uh, uh, pages 30, 32. Uh, the, the argument is that the monolingual Anglophone world is closed out of a vast amount of information, 
a bit later uh, on page 65, it is said that the real difference between advantage and disadvantage in this world where English plays a role is between those who are flexible speakers of English and that's, or of language in general, and that's often the non-native speakers because they have learned to acquire a new language which the monolingual native speakers of English haven't done. So they are, have more flexibility in moving between languages. They can adapt it on an ad hoc basis to find linguistic meaning. Whereas those who are imprisoned in English have a less flexible and more stable mindset and are often less um, uh, successful negotiators in cross-lingual communication. That's around pages 65. And so uh, I was struck by that, but I also very much agree uh, that there is this dimension. But I do feel, and that's my critical suggestion, that I think it's important to stress, I think, that in this uh, battle between English and all the other languages in the global front, the minority of native speakers, because as Rosemary said also during this talk, the native speakers of English are in the minority. There are even as many people learning English in China at the moment as there are native speakers in the world, same about 400 million. So that's, this is, this is mind boggling to understand that this is a minority and on a world scale who speak English as a native language, but still the global communication is being, is increasingly being held in the language of that minority. And so I think it's, for me, morally important to understand that there is a disadvantage here for the non-native speaker. And so I was struck by the fact that in Rosemary's great book, sometimes the argument is that native speakers are losing out without fully realizing it. And in fact, sometimes non-native speakers get the advantage. So to, to, if, 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 um, to, to, to see this, I think, so, so, so I, I think it's definitely the case that English brings obvious, this, uh, obvious advantages. It's fantastic to be able to travel, find medical help, find a job, get social informal contacts, wherever you are on the planet through English. It's an incredible advantage to have this global language. But I think there are four clear disadvantages for non-native speakers, and they result from the fact that there is this coercive global system now in which language between speakers from a different first language occurs in the native language of some, and this brings advantages for the native speakers that are not deserved. They're morally arbitrary, they're undeserved, they shouldn't be there. And so non-native speakers, I think, lose out in this. And I wonder what Rosemary say, uh, thinks about this overall. So, so the disadvantages that I see for non-native speakers are four in kind, I've listed them there. So the first is communicative. So all else being equal, of course, native speakers of English are more fluent in English, funnier, snappier, generally in greater command of the language, better able to convincingly get a point across in discussion, successful in negotiating business deals and giving academic talks in applying for international jobs, occupying positions of political power and so on. Uh, th this is a relevant disadvantage that a non-native speaker faces. Uh, secondly, there's this resource inequality by which I simply mean to, so, so, um, uh, to, to, to speak English, some have to learn English and some get it for free through growing up in the language. And so this, this learning investment is a resource investment that only non-native speakers need to bear. So the burdens of having a system where there's a, one language are borne exclusively by the non-native speakers. Some need to do something extra and it amounts to a lot of work. So Francois Grand, the Swiss economist, has calculated mm. that we need to, to invest up to 15,000 hours to speak English very well. This is time energy, but also money. And this is not borne by the native speaker. Thirdly, perhaps even more importantly, because I think this communication resource issue will dwindle as English becomes even more dominant, as if it really becomes a second language of mankind, the life world issue will not dwindle. It will become worse. So this is the idea that English has a natural connection to a cultural life world, Lebenswelt, if you will. So for example, um, colloquial utterances, idioms, references, Metaphors match the historical culture to which English gives access, but that's not the only point is because speaking a language makes it more likely that you take in new sources and news sources and values and cultural frames of reference uh, expressed in that language, then if because that's the case and because learning that language makes it more likely that you will read sources watch sources from Anglophone media. The result is that with the spread of the language, also the ideas and the shared understandings connected with that cultural life world will travel. And I think that's a bit of a problem. It leads to an increasing Anglo-Americanization of the world, but 
it shouldn't be the case if 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 we perhaps need a global language, but we don't want thereby to have a spread of the culture that was historically connected to that language. And the final issue is the issue of, of dignity. So I think this is a big issue as well. So um, it's understandably come to be an expectation that when a native speaker of English meets a non-native speaker, that the conversation will occur in English. And this gives a sort of stamp of lesser status for the non-native speaker. So um, it's understandable. But it's an issue. It's 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 big. It's a sort of loss of esteem or respect or dignity. And so it even gets a little bit worse, I think, because when they both then speak English, this native and non-native speaker, often within the conversation, the native speaker will have will hold greater sway, greater linguistic symbolic status, voice their thoughts more confidently because they know it better and gain some form of, I would say, undeserved prestige. Now. What Rosemary stresses sometimes in the book is indeed that now native speakers also get some form of disadvantage because of the monolingual mindset, because they're less flexible negotiators. I think that's correct. I think that's important to see and it's helpful to uh, put attention on that. But I want to stress that if I, in my view, that only takes place within that communication setting. So it's only one of the four disadvantages for non-native speakers that get reduced. It becomes less of a disadvantage, this communication issue, because indeed non-native speakers are more flexible, but it's only also partly because at the same time, it's also true that on average, a native speaker is more snappy and successful in negotiating. So it, it balances it out a little bit, but it stays within all the three other categories remain in my view, untouched. And even if they remain untouched, it's only a partially, a part, in part, a, communicative, a communicative balancing out. It's not completely balanced out. And even, I think, essentially, even within simply that communicative box, where indeed it's not as clear anymore, increasingly, also because sometimes non-native speakers are easier to be understood by each other, their English, than native speaker English, which is rife with these, for example, cultural connotations that not all non-native speakers pick up easily. So that's an issue. But even within that communicative box, I feel like the kind of inequality that is correct that some native speakers um, enjoy, face now, because they're maybe less flexible, it's maybe not morally undeserved. It's not. It's it's morally okay. It would seem to me because the native speaker of English might also be a flexible communicator if they learn the other languages, just like the non-native speakers have are forced to do. If only the not, the native speakers did the, did the uh, the work, the labor, then they would also be flexible. So it's not like they cannot by nature or whatever else. It's not enforced on them that they are not flexible. They could become flexible. So in that sense. It's like they are, there's a similar choice set, but one does the work, the other does not. So the disadvantage that a not native, so the disadvantage that a native speaker may enjoy to some extent, because they're less flexible in uh, dealing with, with language issues, is in a way deserved. It's not bad. We don't want to compensate for that. It's, I mean, they should also, they shouldn't be lazy. They should also do the work. That's a suggestion. It's a provocative question, but I just, I'm curious to hear what Rosemary thinks. Thank you very much. This was a fantastic read. Uh, thank you, Helder. These normative questions were floating through my head through this monstrous book, <laughs> and, and I and I found it very uh, difficult to deal with them. You couldn't; they weren't. And, and, and maybe this is um, unfair, perhaps coming from an, an American and a native English speaker. But I just they were too large for me to to wrap my arms around. Uh, and and so I kind of skirted around them. You know, I would dip into them a little bit and then come out of it again, because I, that couldn't be the, the, the focus of the project, where the focus of the project, for right or wrong, uh, was really looking at English in a more pragmatic way. You know, this is what we have. This is what has been brought to us post-World War II, where the United States has risen in power. And I understand that English comes with a significant amount of cultural baggage and historical baggage. I don't, I don't believe it's a neutral language. It is not a neutral language at all. But what is it we do? In a perfect world, it would have been different. In a perfect world, perhaps, English would not have been the dominant language. Although I do believe that there is a utility to having a common form means of communication 
a global common form of communication. But what do we do with what we're left with now? And how do we try to looking at each of these countries and that and I and I carefully selected them because they were in different historical and political contexts, you know, whether it was South Africa and apartheid, whether it was Rwanda and the genocide, whether it was Morocco trying to, you know, looking back at, at uh, Arabization in, in Morocco uh, and working with more indigenous languages in Morocco as well as against French, as against English, um, and trying to, um, trying to define what the problems were, how English is intersecting in all these different political and historical contexts, what problems are arising? How are these countries trying to deal with them and trying to make some mild suggestions of what could be done? Uh, and so I totally agree with you in terms of the normative questions that they really are very important. It was just not the project of the book. Okay, so putting that aside, it, you know, a, some of what informed my book, which doesn't come out in the book, uh, is my own background. You know, that while I was working on my, my PhD, uh, I was teaching and uh, working in various ways within higher education and elementary and secondary school, running bilingual programs in very disadvantaged communities in New York City for Italian speaking, French, Haitian speaking, and Spanish speaking students. And so I got to see what language is like in these poor immigrant communities and, and the justices and injustices within those communities in terms of language uh, and the disadvantages to these children in trying to learn a second language. I also grew up in a community that was very multilingual. It, it was a community where it was post-World War II. Almost all of us, my friends, we all had grandparents who spoke another language. Uh, my own grandparents, three of them were Italian immigrants, and I saw the use of their language, even their code switching through, you know, a non-standard form of Italian to a standard form of Italian, and when they did that, the social cues that, that would provoke that. So I, I was an observer of language and multilingualism from birth, you could say, uh, and then worked in these poor communities. Uh, and so I, I really wanted to try to take that perspective and put it on a more global context to see what else I could learn and what else I might, what other perspectives I could offer. It, it was as much as I wanted the book to be accessible to a wide and, and international audience, I also wanted, to wanted it to have scholarly merit. And so I did engage in all the scholarship uh, of you know, political philosophers and sociolinguists and economists and it's all in there. And it was the, the political philosophers, that piece that tr quite frankly troubled me the most because I felt that that was the piece I wasn't addressing. Uh, and yet I just didn't feel like it was, it was really uh, the project. But I wanted to uh, respond to uh, one, one comment that you do, did make about communication for um, Americans, that for Americans, it's just a matter of, well, if they don't speak foreign languages or Anglophones, if they don't speak foreign languages, all it means is it's, they have to learn how to communicate. I really believe there's much more to it than just communication. I think Anglophones are really missing out on many worldviews. And you know, and I say that in the book, that it really is so culturally isolating them uh, that I don't wanna be you know, so Worfian to say that language puts a clamp on your perception of reality, but there is some connection between your language and your perception and your worldview, your perception of reality. And I really believe that Anglophones are living in this cultural and um, intellectual, if you want, bubble, uh, and they don't realize it. And so a big pitch of the book was to bring Anglophones out of that comfort zone. And I felt that maybe that would so try to begin leveling the playing field if Anglophones could understand what a privileged place they really hold. Where, you know, we go to conferences and the conferences are in English and we're able to, yes, we could be snappy and we could be funny and we could be nuanced. But if I had to give that same presentation in French or Italian, it wouldn't be the same. Uh, and I know that. 
And by learning another language, you do understand then the kind of pain, if you will, that other people are going through in trying to communicate in this global language. Um, so I, I don't know if that really answered your question, but it gave you some sense of uh, my angst, if you will, uh, in writing the book and the, the issues that I knew I wasn't addressing, but they were just beyond the project of the book itself. Thank you so yeah. much, Rosemary. Uh, Helder, did you want to briefly respond? Yeah, shall I take this presentation down because I don't want to enforce? I can, I can do that for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary. This was great. I didn't want to say that there's anything lacking in the book. That's not my point. I was just curious. I mean, this isn't one of the threats in the book that you just also re uh, repeated that uh, maybe Anglophone native, English native speakers are losing out on something, this monolingual mindset being imprisoned in English. So that's, it struck me, I like that very much. I also agree. I just felt coming from this view whereby I think the non-native speakers get a worse deal out of this ultimately. Uh, it struck me that a native speaker of English would say, well, maybe we also get a problem there. And it's true. I just felt like, but you just, I think said that yourself, that there's a privileged position that remains untouched, although what you say is a relevant footnote or relevant, yeah, relevant uh, objection to that monolingual mindset. That's important, I think, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, so I will pose them and we'll see how much we can get done. Um, one is regarding the policies that are put in place to preserve the native or national languages or local languages um, in various places throughout the world. Are these types of policies embraced across the political spectrum, like the local political spectrum, or they, do they tend to be politicized and associated with particular parties, like, um, for example, nationalist parties um, or more progressive parties or so on? And then a second one is this idea of like standard or correct English. Um, you have a monopoly on this by both the UK and the US versions of standard English, but in other areas where English has been spoken for perhaps hundreds of years, you mentioned the Indian government example. Um, can there be other forms of standard English? And if not, does this monopoly on standard English give some sort of particular authority to UK or US uh, speakers of the language? I'd love to hear your thoughts on these. Okay, first, uh, yeah, I mean, the policies that I saw in place were uh, tied very often to a particular party. Certainly in India, you know, it's tied to to the nationalist, the current nationalist party, and, and to uh, and to Modi essentially promoting and very and very aggressively pushing Hindi uh, with a lot of backlash, you know, from other regional languages, particularly particularly in the south. Um, I think India, Morocco, to some extent as well. You see. There's been a, a little switch in, you know, a new uh, election, a new government coming in. So you see a little switch in, in the perspective or the emphasis between French and English uh, and Arabic. So they are, they are politically driven. The policies for sure uh, are, politically, are politically driven if you look at country by country. Um, and uh, in South Africa, it's so politically and historically driven. Uh, so much said against the history of apartheid uh, and what place Afrikaans should still hold uh, in the country. And, and that seems to be almost like an irresolvable issue. Uh, and it goes to you know, some of the questions that, that Helda was raising as to you know, what, is, what would be most uh, the moral position or the just position with regard to Afrikaans vis-a-vis -vis English, vis-a-vis uh, African languages. And that's a project that South Africa is really struggling with in a political sense, set against this history. So history and politics have really governed uh, what these policies ended up being. The idea of uh, other forms of English and whether they should be recognized or like Singlish, for example, in, in Singapore, uh, or other what we would call non-standard forms of English, whether they should be recognized. I think that on a, I don't think there's a global answer to that. I think that's more of a, a national answer as to what extent uh, a, a, a different form of English is going to be widely accepted by that particular society. So I think some of these, some of these questions cannot be answered on a global, on, on a, a global level. Uh, whether non-standard non -standard forms of English are going to be accepted 
on a global level? I think that's another question. You know, to what extent is what we call standard British or American English, and it's moving more toward American English and away from Brit British English in terms of certain uh, pronunciation or certain spelling. I think that's, that's more the orthography. Um, that's a more global question. And I, and I still believe whether it's right or wrong, I still believe that the standard form of English is going to hold sway. And that's what students are being taught uh, in schools. And that's the, the acceptable right or wrong form of communication, particularly in business, if you will, or in the, in the academic world. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of other questions, but unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to them, but I might pass them along to you so you can have a look and, um, we, and see some of the interesting comments that have been brought up. But unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. And I would really like to thank uh, both Rosemary and Helder for participating in today's discussion and for this really excellent presentation. Very interesting. Uh, and also to our audience for joining us today, especially those in Belgium who are uh, having a public holiday. Nice to tune in on a holiday. And before leaving you today, I'd like to briefly inform you that the GLOBE webinar series will actually continue next week on Tuesday, um, on the 31st of May, with Kenneth Abbott and Duncan Snydel on their new book, The Spectrum of International Institutions. And you can register for that one at globe-project.eu, and you can see the rest of our spring and summer lineup there as well. So on behalf of the GLOBE Project, thank you both uh, for joining us today, and, and thank you all to the audience for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. It was pretty nice. Thank you. Goodbye.